Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome to the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War Annual Lecture 2023. Um, I'm utterly delighted, um, giddy almost, um, thrilled to have Professor Margaret Macmillan here with us today. Um, Margaret is Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Toronto and Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford. She was Provost of Trinity College, Toronto from 2002 to 7 and Warden of St. Anthony's College, Oxford from 07 to 17. She's currently a trustee of the Imperial War Museum. Her research specializes, which you probably know already, in British Imperial history and in the international history of the 19th and 20th century. Her latest book is War, How Conflict Shaped Us. And other in publications include Paris, 1919, and The War That Ended Peace. She gave the CBC's Massey Lectures in 2015 and the BBC's Wreath Lectures in 2018. More importantly, of course, today, you're giving this to Michael Howard. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, awards include the Samuel Johnson Prize for nonfiction and the Governor General's Literary Award. She has honorary degrees from several universities and is an honorary fellow of the British Academy. She is also a companion of the Order of Canada, a companion of Honor UK, and member of the Order of Merit. Not a bad life, um, not a bad effort. Um, so today, Margaret's gonna to talk to us about an unlikely match, the Grand Alliance in the Second World War. I think Margaret's gonna talk for about 40 minutes, then we'll engage in a series of questions for about another 40 minutes. And afterwards, we can retire to the, the drinks at the back and, and chat away. So over to you, Margaret. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to stand up so I can see anyone in the back who falls asleep. But thank you very much for that, that kind introduction. And it is a great pleasure and a great privilege to be giving this to Michael Howard lecture. I knew him. Um, before I knew him, I, I read his books and his essays with great admiration. I think his book on the Franco-Prussian War is one of the few books I stayed up all night to finish because it was just such a good story. And I used to go and see him. He, he lived in Berkshire in a very pretty little village. And when I was in Oxford, I'd drive over and see him. And I knew that if I took him smoked salmon and, and, a, and a couple of mystery stories or thrillers, this would be the appropriate thing to take. We both shared um, a taste, a low taste probably, for mystery stories and thrillers. I don't know what it is about academics, but we love stories about murder. Um, maybe it's something to do with the lives we live, but um, we used to, my, so my, Michael and I would talk about this, and, and what I wish, and I think all of us who knew him wish, is that we'd been like Boswell and written down some of the things he said, because he was extremely wise, and many of the things he said occasionally float back into my memory as, I, as I'm thinking about the present. So it is a great honor and a great pleasure to be giving the lecture in his name. And talking about alliances, I think, is something that actually is quite apposite at the moment. I think we've all been thinking about the nature of alliances, how they work, whether they can work, will they last? I was talking to someone just before we started who said he was possibly going to ask a question about will NATO survive? And it's a good question. Um, at the moment, NATO seems to have been revivified, but how long that will go on depends on a number of things, including the next presidential election in the United States. And so I think, Alliances is something that we think about in the present and have certainly been very much part of the past. I could go back to the Delian League, but that might take us a very long time for me to get up to the present again. Views on alliances vary. Um, the famous Churchill statement was that there's only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that is fighting without them. And that was Churchill in the Second World War, as recorded by Lord Allenbrook. General Eisenhower, who knew a fair thing about alliances as the Supreme Allied Commander, wrote in 1948 about, and I quote, the ineptitude of coalitions in waging war. He said even Napoleon's reputation as a military leader suffered when students in Staff College came to realize that, realize that he always fought against coalitions and therefore against divided councils and diverse political, economic, and military interests. Alliances, as we know, can be, however, positive. They can be a basis for victory, which the Grand Alliance in the Second World War was. The British and French Alliance, and then joined by the Americans, and the, of course, with the Italians from earlier on in the First World War, 
is an example of a successful alliance. It's not always easy to achieve, but eventually it did result in victory in the First World War. And of course, the Grand Alliance, the original Grand Alliance, uh, which was formed against Napoleon in 1814 and 1815 and successfully ended his rule. Um, you will not see much about it in the movie Napoleon. I don't know how many of you have seen it. You will see a great deal of Josephine. Um, any rate, so alliances can be positive, and I think you can argue that NATO on the whole has been positive for its members. It's provided mutual security, and it has provided, and a very, it provided a very necessary deterrent in the Cold War. And so alliances can be positive. Um, they can also be, and many people see them as dangerous, um, the danger that an alliance may lead us into trouble of some sort. And of course, what comes to mind is the famous statement, the famous warning by George Washington in his farewell address, which he published in 1796, that the United States should not interweave its destiny with any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice. It is, he said, our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliances with any portion of the foreign world. And in some ways, I think that view is still there, influencing American foreign policy and American attitudes towards the world. The United States, of course, was fortunate in being able to remain free of entangling alliances because of its geography, because it was protected by the two great oceans of the world, and because of its size. Smaller powers have not had that luxury. Smaller powers have often had to put themselves into alliances, bandwagoning, as the political scientists call it, because they have no alternative. And of course, there is a further danger when the small powers ally with big powers, that in some cases, the larger power may find itself drawn into conflicts of the smaller power. This was very much the case with Russia and Serbia in the First World War. Russia made an ally, and Serbia was, of course, eager to make the alliance with the much smaller country of Serbia, and in doing so, took on Serbia's quarrels with Austria-Hungary and, and with its neighbors. And the problem always for great powers is when they have small allies, the question of prestige and authority comes in. So that if they abandon their smaller ally, they are seen as somehow weak and unable to, to carry out their commitments. I think you could argue very much the same about China with North Korea. I, I think the Chinese would dearly love to see a different sort of North Korea, which is a dangerous and unstable power in the, in the North Pacific. But if they abandon North Korea, then what does it say about Chinese authority and Chinese position in the world? You could also say the United States faces the same dilemma with Israel, that it has committed itself to a much smaller power and therefore has taken on the quarrels of that much smaller power. The alliance system, as it was called, we know is often blamed for the outbreak of the First World War. The idea that Europe had divided itself into two very tight alliance systems, the triple alliance of Germany, Austria, Hungary, and I'm trying to remember the third one now, Italy, um, because Italy did not actually stay in, and then the triple entente of Russia, France, and Britain. In fact, those alliance systems were much looser than some people would have it. Um, there, were, there were only a couple of military alliances within the triple entente and, and, the, and the triple alliance. And of course, the thing always, with uh, there was no military alliance, no commitment that Britain made to either France or Russia beyond informal, uh, informal suggestions. And the only countries that were obliged to come to each other's defense in the Triple Entente were France and Russia. And the only countries that were obliged to come to each other's defense were Germany and Austria-Hungary. The Italians were able to stay out and in, of course, due course, we're going to join the Triple Entente. So I would argue the alliance system wasn't really a system and did not really lead to the outbreak of the First World War. Alliances can also be transactional and temporary, made for a particular purpose, dissolved as soon as that particular purpose is achieved. And of course, the British were very good at doing this. Lord Palmerston's famous statement um, that no country is marked out as the eternal ally or the perpetual enemy of, of England. We have no eternal allies and we have no perpetual enemies. Our interests are eternal and perpetual and those interests it is our duty to follow. And so the whole question of alliances, are they good, are they bad, what are they for, is one that is still very much up in the air. There are also two different, largely two different definitions of what alliances are. 
I'm going to go with the second one, but let me give you the first one. The first one is rather narrow, and it is that it is, alliance consists of a treaty binding two or more independent states to come to each other's aid with armed force under certain circumstances. That usually means an attack or threat on one of the alliance partners. In fact, um, you can sometimes get larger alliances than, than just two. NATO Article 5, an attack on one, is an attack on all. I would argue that alliances are more than that narrow definition, that they're not just a promise to come to each other's aids in the case of an attack. They're not just about military force, not just about the resistance to force or the application of force. That alliances can actually involve the management or constraint of others. Bismarck, for example, the German chancellor, formed the dual alliance with Austria-Hungary in 1879, partly to keep it under control. He was afraid of a war, which was always a possibility between Austria-Hungary and Russia, and he felt that if Germany allied itself to Austria-Hungary, there would be less chance of it getting into a confrontation with Russia. And alliances can also be about shared values, promoting a particular view of the world, promoting particular values in the world. The Concert of Europe did not involve um, the five powers in the Concert of Europe after the Napoleonic Wars, um, Prussia, Austria, France, Russia, and England, or Britain, did not involve them signing necessarily formal treaties with each other, but it was an informal arrangement where they would work together, they would consult with each other, when it looked like the peace of Europe was going to be threatened again. It was basically a conservative grouping, but I would call it an alliance, and, and, and in fact was quite a successful alliance. But the more modern alliances we've seen have also involved more than just coming to each other's defense. They've involved trying to, pr to promote a particular way of organizing and running the world. Um, Roosevelt, Frank Franklin Delano Roosevelt, during the Second World War and Woodrow Wilson in the First World War were very anxious that the wars should result in a different world order, that they should result in a, in a world order in which nations work collectively to defend each other, that they work collectively to ameliorate conditions in the world or to remove conditions in the world that might cause wars. And so I would argue that alliances involve much more than simple military arrangements, that they involve this sharing of goals, shared interests, sharing of, of values in some cases. And so I'm going to be going with the second rather, rather broader definition, but that doesn't mean that fear and the fear and, and the possibility of a threat aren't very important ingredients in making an alliance. The Grand Alliance in the Second World War was something that Roosevelt, with support from Churchill, who was always more um, cynical, I think, about the possibilities of, of a liberal international world order, but the alliance in the Second World War was something that President Roosevelt thought and a number of smaller powers thought was going to result in a better world order. The United Nations was meant to provide the sort of collective security that the, United, the League of Nations had failed to, to provide. And it was meant to, again, deal with some of the problems in the world that helped to cause wars. A number of the institutions and organizations from the League of Nations were in fact carried over into the United Nations and continued to carry out the same sorts of things that the League had tried to do getting rid of gun trafficking, for example, getting rid of slavery, improving working conditions around the world, um, trying to deal with some of the inequities and, and injustices in the world. So that the pro possibility and the hope was there in the Second World War that the Grand Alliance would carry over into peacetime and begin to make the world the sort of place where another war, even worse, because it the weaponry would have become even worse, even worse than the First and Second World Wars would not happen. And so there was, I think, a very real sense that the Grand Alliance, Britain, British Empire, United States, and the Soviet Union would come together as the three great world powers after 1945 and build a different sort of world. Well, of course, often the problems with alliances, the reason they come into being will disappear. The Grand Alliance would not have come into being, I think, without Hitler. It is highly unlikely, given the histories and the outlooks and the ideologies and the values of the three great partners in the Grand Alliance. It's without Hitler, they would not have come together, and I'll talk about that a bit in a moment. But of course, it was the fact of Hitler attacking Britain, threatening the United States, and then attacking uh, Russia 
and then after Pearl Harbor declaring war on the United States that created the Grand Alliance. They had no choice but to come together. And as so often with alliances, they stayed together to win the war. But as the end of the war drew closer, the glue that held them together began to dissolve and began to weaken. And the very real differences between the three great parties to the Grand Alliance, is Grand Alliance began to show up. And of course, one of the most difficult things with, with alliances, and I think we're seeing this today with NATO and, and with the um, coalition, which is the even wider coalition than NATO, which is supporting Ukraine, is that not, alliances, like any relationships, have to be nurtured and maintained. And very important in any alliance is at least some congruence of attitudes, some overlapping of values. If you have completely incompatible partners, then it's highly unlikely that they're going to be able to work together. And of course, one very important ingredient of an alliance is, is the building of trust, um, the, the hope and, and allaying the fear that one party to the alliance will, will go off and make a separate peace with whoever it is that they're fighting. Um, Napoleon managed to hang on to power, I think, for so long because partly he was able to make separate pieces with the parties that eventually came. He made a separate piece with Prussia. He made a separate piece with Russia. He made a separate piece with Austria. He never made a separate piece with Britain, and, and neither side, neither Britain nor or France were prepared to do that. But Napoleon was able, I think, to last as long as he did because he was able to maneuver among those who had opposed him. And it was only at the end, at the sixth attempt, that Metternich, the great Austrian chancellor, managed to bring a coalition together which stuck together just long enough to defeat Napoleon. So there is always that danger that one party in an alliance will see that its interests are not being met, feel that it's not really worth fighting in this particular struggle, thinks that peace might be better. And it's certainly something that in the Second World War, Stalin in particular was very conscious of. Um, he never trusted the capitalist powers and he had some reason uh, not to trust them, but he was nevertheless, I think, unlikely to, to trust them. He, he had a deeply suspicious nature and, and was heavily if, influenced. He saw the world through the eyes of his own theories, um, Marxist theories, Leninist theories, and, and his own contributions to them. And he felt that it was impossible that he could ever entirely entrust what he saw as capitalist powers. And he was always watching out for signs that Britain or the United States, that Churchill or Roosevelt were talking to Hitler in 1942, for example, he sent a telegram to his ambassador in London, Maisky, and said, all of us in Moscow have gained the impression that Churchill is aiming at the defeat of the USSR in order then to come to terms with the Germany of Hitler or Brüning at the expense of our country. And throughout the war, much as, as I think the French had felt in the First World War, throughout the war he had felt that the British and the Americans actually wanted to see the Soviet Union bled dry by the German invaders so that they could eventually then come in and, and scoop up parts of it. And so maintaining an alliance takes a great deal of diplomacy, takes a great deal of reassurance, takes a great deal of care. It's not something you just make and then leave it and it simply works. It takes a great deal of time and energy. One of the reasons that Roosevelt announced at Casablanca in, in, in January 1943, um, it was really his idea, but Churchill went along with it, that the Allies would have a policy, at least the British and Americans would have a policy of unconditional surrender, was to reassure Stalin that there was no way that they were going to make um, any sort of deal with Germany, that Germany would have to be utterly, utterly defeated. That did not, alas, actually allay um, Stalin's fears. And so a very important part of the Grand Alliance in the Second World War is the highly personal diplomacy, um, not just the meetings between the leaders. There were only two meetings between all three leaders, um, one at Tehran in the autumn of 1943 and then the other one at Yalta in February 1945. By the time the three leaders of the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union met again in Potsdam, Roosevelt was dead and he'd been replaced by President Harry Truman and Churchill was going to be replaced halfway through because of the general election that was held in Britain. So much to Stalin's amazement, Churchill was defeated and, and Clement Attlee appeared in his stead in Potsdam. But those meetings of the leaders, I think, were terribly important because they, in the case of Churchill and Roosevelt, they did 
know each other personally. In the case of Stalin, neither man knew Stalin. And it was very important, I think, that they should meet. What was also important was the contacts and the missions that were sent between the leaders of the three great powers. Roosevelt said, sent perhaps his most trusted emissary, Harry Hopkins, who had been with him since the early 1930s, since the beginning of the New Deal. And he sent Hopkins as soon as, as Germany had attacked in, in Barbarossa in, 1940, in, in, in 1941, he sent Hopkins to, to Moscow to talk to Stalin. And this was, I think, a very important indicator of the importance that he placed on the relationship. And he was to use Hopkins a very sick Hopkins, a Hopkins who had to be lifted off airplanes, uh, given blood transfusions, who, who volunteered, had nevertheless to do it. Hopkins was his emissary. He sent Hopkins for the last time in 1945, and the trip pretty much killed Hopkins. But this was very important. Um, if you couldn't meet, and, and of course meeting was, was extremely difficult, extremely dangerous. If, if you look at the trips that these men took, particularly Roosevelt, who traveled the greatest distance and, and was probably the, the frailest physically. Um, Stalin, very only once or twice when he came to Potsdam, but when he went to Tehran, left, um, left, left the Soviet Union. Otherwise, he obliged, and even so, he obliged Churchill and Roosevelt to come to him. But if you look at the travels and the dangers of those travels, um, you understand the great importance that both Roosevelt and Churchill placed on the contact that they could make with Stalin. Uh, when they could not travel themselves, they did it through emissaries. And they also had a very extensive correspondence, which has been edited and published. Uh, that correspondence often sounds as though it's very casually written. I mean, Churchill and Roosevelt will send happy birthdays to Stalin on his birthday, or they'll send him congratulations on a victory. But those letters that were sent went through the Foreign Office, went through the State Department, were revised, amended. Every word was very heavily weighed. And the same thing with the letters from Stalin back to Churchill and Roosevelt. So the communication was seen as extremely important, where possible face to face, but were it not through, through letters um, which, were sent, which were sent over diplomatic, was usually sent over diplomatic cables. Bringing these three countries together and bringing their three leaders together meant that a great deal of history had to be overcome, uh, not just between the Soviet Union and the British and the Americans, but initially between the Americans and the British. Um, the Americans and the British were moving closer to each other after 1939, after the Second World War broke out in Europe, but it was not an easy relationship because there was too much that they remembered. They remembered their uneasy relationship in the 1920s and 1930s. There was very bad feeling between the United States and, and, and the British government over, for example, the war loans that the American government had raised post-1917 to help finance the Allied war effort. And Britain had been a major beneficiary of those war loans. The Americans felt the British were dragging their feet on paying them back. The British felt that the Americans didn't appreciate the sacrifice they'd made. And there was a very bad-tempered correspondence plus face-to-face -face discussions between the British and the Americans throughout the 1920s, uh, where the British would point out just how many lives they'd lost, how much they'd paid for the war, um, more or less underlining the point, although they didn't quite say so openly, that the United States had benefited from British sacrifices and the Americans were, were demanding their blood money in a way that the British felt was very unfair. There was also very bad feeling over the Manchurian crisis of 1931, where the British felt the Americans weren't prepared to do enough and the Americans felt the British were expecting them to take a role in the Pacific, which they were not yet ready to take. I think it goes deeper than that, too. There were those, including President Roosevelt himself, who looked back to the American Revolution and said how lucky we were to escape from the British Empire, um, that the British were um, snobbish, the British didn't understand the United States, the British looked down on Americans. Um, Joseph Kennedy, the father of President Kennedy, who was the American ambassador, in London for the late part of the 1930s complained that the only movies the British ever saw about Americans were gangsters and thugs and cowboys and that gave them a very false impression of what American life was like. And the Americans had similar views of the, of, of the British. Um, the British felt the Americans were uneducated, um, un, 
and, and cultivated, not all British felt like this, and, and a great many British people actually had gone to the United States, lived there, worked there, knew Americans. But there were these stereotypes, and the Americans had this view of the British as being um, very snobbish, um, rather effete, um, very, very devious. There's a wonderful quotation, which I must just find for you, um, if I can find it here, from um, Air Marshal Slesser, who said, the trouble with us is that even when we do something really stupid, the Americans think we're being very devious. And they try and work out what it actually is that we're up to. And so I think you had, um, a, while you had a willingness on both sides to work together, and there were certainly those, including President Roosevelt himself, who felt that it was definitely in the United States' interest that Britain should not be defeated, and hoped that uh, the British would be able to hold out and was prepared to go to considerable lengths, uh, exceeding perhaps, it's still a matter of debate, his power to funnel American military supplies. Um, for example, declaring destroyers obsolete or declaring aircraft were not necessary for the defense of the United States and funneling them to the British. There were still those in the United States who felt that the British were simply going to take advantage of the Americans, that they had done so in the First World War. A number of those in the American military actually a um, number of the, the generals in the American army felt that if they were going to fight anyone, they'd rather fight the British than the Germans. So you do get, you do get these feelings, these stereotypes, which I think can be extremely important. And then, of course, there are the differences in ideology. Um, the Americans, it was not as severe between the Americans and, and the British, but the Americans tended to think that the British were not truly Democrats, that they didn't truly understand what the will of the people meant. They didn't understand the glories of the American Constitution. And the British tended to feel that the Americans were dangerously populist, um, tended to appeal that American politicians tended to appeal to the lowest common denominator. You don't have to agree with any of these, but this is certainly how both British and Americans tended to think. Well, if the differences in styles, in stereotypes, and ideology were great between, or significant between Britain and the United States, you can imagine how much greater they were between the Soviet Union on the one hand and the United States and Britain and its empire on the other. Stalin's view was that they were capitalist powers and as such they were doomed probably to fight each other first but eventually whoever won to turn on the Soviet Union. Now there is much debate about Stalin's motivations and what his ideas on foreign policy were my own view for what it's worth is that he was in someone who saw through Marxist eyes. He believed that capitalism was doomed to eventually fall out. Capitalists were doomed eventually to fall out with each other. He believed that they were the enemies of socialism, that if possible, they would strangle social socialism in its cradle. And the only cradle where socialism had really taken root and where the baby was thriving was the Soviet Union itself. And so he saw them as enemies. He believed that initially, at least, the war that broke out was simply a fight. Uh, Hitler was a capitalist, the United States, Britain, France, all capitalist countries. They were simply fighting over who would dominate the world. Eventually, one of them would become triumphant and at that point would begin, maybe not right away, he tended to think the Soviet Union would have about 30 years, would turn on the Soviet Union because that was the nature of capitalism that violent class struggle was the only way in which change was going to take place in the world. Others have argued that he really was a Russian nationalist. And there is some evidence for this, um, partly because he was Georgian, who as, as often people from the fringes of empires become even more devoted to the empire than those who were born into it. Um, Stalin was always embarrassed by his Georgian accent and the actor who played him in the many adulatory films that were made about him uh, modified over time, I think he probably had some suggestions and hints from the boss, modified over time his Georgian accent so that by the end, Stalin was pe speaking absolutely perfectly fluent Russian in the movies without, or the actor playing Stalin without a hint of a Georgian accent. Stalin admired, he was a great reader, he admired leaders like Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great enormously. There is that famous moment which Molotov recalls towards the end of the Second World War where Stalin is looking at a map and he's looking at the periphery of the Soviet Union. He's saying, oh yes, we got that back. 
We got the Baltic countries back. Um, we got part of Poland back. He said, sort of out loud thinking to himself, I've got back pretty well everything that the Tsars had. And so I think, yes, there was a strong element of Russian nationalism in Stalin. But I, my view is that his ideology as a communist, as a Marxist, meshed with his Russian nationalism. He felt that the Russian proletariat was the most advanced part of the proletariat of the world, the most advanced workers of the world, that they were the most pure revolutionaries. And so in defending the homeland of these pure revolutionaries in Russia, he was also defending the future of socialism. In addition, I think, because he had amassed, of course, enormous power within the Soviet Union, he'd come to think of himself as embodying this meshing of nationalism, Russian nationalism, and, and socialism, that he was essential for the survival of socialism, essential to protect it within Russia, and essential to make sure that eventually it would be able to spread throughout the world. And so, I may be wrong, but I think this is one of the ways to understand Stalin, that in his own mind, there was no distinction between being a Russian nationalist and being a, a, a profound socialist, and no difference between protecting his own power and protecting the homeland of socialism in Russia. So that you get um, very, very different views of the world between the, what we call the Western allies, the United States and, and Britain, and the Soviet Union. And what you also have, just as you have between the United States and Britain, memories of past differences, past insults, past hurts, past grievances, you certainly have those with Russia and the Western powers more with Britain than with the United States. Russian views on the United States were fairly, as far as their views on capitalist powers went, were fairly moderate. Um, they tended to see, well, partly the United States was very far away, and so it wasn't a direct threat as the capitalist powers in, in Europe, much closer, uh, were a threat. But they also tended, there was a certain sentimentality, which you saw sometimes in the United States as well, that the Russians and the Americans were both frontier people. They had both expanded across vast continents. They had something in common. And there was. Lenin, for example, greatly admired American business and production methods, um, something called Taylorism. Uh, there was a famous um, industrial engineer who divided up tasks in factories into single discrete tasks so you could build an assembly line and someone would do the same task every time repetitively and you could produce much more than if you had someone doing a number of two or three different things. And Lenin introduced, and Stalin followed his practice, the practice of Taylorism into the Soviet Union in the 1920s. In fact, hired American engineers to come and work in the Soviet Union. And so although the United States was a capitalist power and therefore tainted as all capitalist powers were in the Soviet mind by its propensity, its willingness to fight to destroy socialism, it wasn't quite as bad as the others. The one for the Soviet Union that was the most dangerous, and certainly in Stalin's view, you get this, was Britain. And the British Empire, because it vanished so quickly at the end of the Second World War, we tend to forget just how powerful Britain looked in the 1920s and in the 1930s. And for Stalin, the British Empire was the great enemy of the Soviet Union. It had been the great enemy in the Civil War, which Russia had endured at the beginning of, of the, of the, from 1918 to 1922. And its leader, Britain's leader, Churchill, had been one of the most fervent advocates of intervention against the Soviet experiment, against the Bolsheviks, in the years immediately after the First World War. I mean, you're probably all familiar with what Churchill said. Um, among his more mild epithets about the Bolsheviks were blood-stained, hairy baboons. Um, and he vociferously talked in the press, in Parliament, and to his colleagues about sending forces to destroy the Bolshevik exp experiment in Russia. And this was not something that Stalin, of course, forgot, and the Russians did not forget. And so they always had much deeper suspicions of Churchill than they did of Roosevelt. Nevertheless, they, they regarded both as, as being part and parcel of the same, of the same, of the same type of thinking. What Stalin seems to have thought in the case of the Second World War was that, well, first of all, he thought as the Americans had done that the capitalists would fight for a time among themselves. He was absolutely shocked when France fell in 1940. Um, he's reported to have said they couldn't have, they shouldn't have. 
Um, he thought that the first, Second World War would be like the First World War, that there would be a very long stalemate, that the French would fight to defend French territory and that the war would drag on for a number of years and that he and the Soviet Union would have time to prepare for what was going to be the inevitable attack at some point by the capitalist powers. It's one of the reasons that Stalin did the Nazi-Soviet pact with, with, with Nazi Germany. He felt that he could buy time, he felt that he could work on the divisions among the capitalist powers, but that he would have plenty of time. Um, he was, of course, to be um, very, very shocked by this. He, but he also, as the war dragged on and as the United States came in, then thought that once the war was over, that there would be this period of reconstruction and rebuilding. He, in fact, thought that the United States, which by the end of 1945 had become the world's leading economic power, responsible for something like 45% of all production in the world, he thought the United States was going to have to export, was going to have to find markets, including in Russia, otherwise it would have a slump like it had at the end of the First World War. And so his assumption was, which in many ways was, was not correct, was that the United States would eventually go to war with Britain, the two would eventually fall out. The United States would probably triumph because it was now much the greater power by 1945, but that he had time. And that in the shorter run, the capitalist powers, again, the United States in particular, would want to conciliate the Soviet Union, want to work with the Soviet Union, would want to use the markets which the Soviet Union could provide and, and if necessary, use the raw materials of the, of, of the, of the United States. So of, of the Soviet Union. And so you get very different views of the world. You get these suspicions which come out of the past. The only thing I think that could have made this relationship work was, as I say, Hitler himself, that Hitler called into being the alliance that was eventually going to destroy him. It was never going to be an easy alliance, even between the British and the Americans but of course much more so between the Soviets and the uh, British and the Americans. The British and the Americans did have their tensions, but they were somehow part of the same family. They spoke the same language, even if they misunderstood each other sometimes. Um, there's a famous moment where um, Eisenhower, I think it was, complained and said, um, no, sorry, it was, it was Eisenhower who was there, <clears throat> One of Churchill's um, advisors, may have been Alan Brooks, said, you really cleaned my clock with that. And Eisenhower said, you mean he actually fixes clocks? There, there, there can be, even when you speak the same language, there can be misunderstandings. Um, but the British and the Americans developed a much fuller relationship than either ever developed with the Soviet Union. There was something like, by the end of the war, there was something like 10,000 British officials working in Washington on a whole variety of projects from borrowing money to placing orders in American factories to dealing with all the issues of a very, very full alliance. Something like 1.5 million American soldiers, um, American military went through Britain during in the course of the First World War, in the course of, the, sorry, the Second World War, um, changing in some ways British society. There were tensions when, when there were American servicemen here. Uh, a lot of British disapproved of the American Army's practice of keeping it's black soldiers in segregated units and trying to prevent them from going to British pubs. And there were actually protests from the British and in the British press. Um, there were also complaints um, the, in, in the famous phrase that sums it up. The Americans are overpaid, oversexed, and over here. Um, there were feelings that the Americans were just too attractive to British women. They could give them things like nylon stockings. They, their uniforms were smarter. They had more money to spend. And so there were always tensions in the relationship. And, and always unease. And there were often very serious disagreements. I mean, the American military always worried when Churchill was going to meet Roosevelt because they felt that Churchill could be so persuasive he would talk Roosevelt into doing something the, the Americans didn't want to do. So there was always this fear that the British were trying to inveigle the Americans into doing things that the Americans shouldn't do. And among a lot of American officials, including in the military, there was a feeling that the British really were trying to use the Americans to support the British Empire. And this you often get in the, in the correspondence and in the statements, we are not doing this to support the British Empire. We're doing it to defeat Japan. We're doing it to defeat the, the fascist powers in Europe. The British may think that we're going to save their empire for them, but we won't. 
And from the top down, from Roosevelt himself, the Americans made a very clear message that they expected the British Empire would begin to be wound up. In fact, at Tehran in 1943, Churchill said, uh, sorry, Roosevelt said to, to Stalin, um, poor old Winston, he, he wants to hang on to it all, but I really think you know, the Indians need to revolt against him. An extraordinary thing for an American president to say to the Soviet dictator, undermining his own ally, Churchill. But there was this American attitude that the Britain's time had come, it had gone, and now it was the time of the Americans, and the Americans wanted to see a different sort of world. As far as the relationship between either the United States or Britain with the Soviet Union went, there really was hardly a relationship at all. Soviet society was so closed, so paranoid about spies, so afraid of outsiders, that there was no way that large numbers of foreigners could come and live within the Soviet Union. The few diplomats who were allowed to come to Moscow were constrained. They knew that the people working for them were also working for the KGB. They knew they were being spied upon. They knew they were being watched all the time. They often found it very difficult to meet their Soviet counterparts. Um, they were constantly being put off. Um, Stalin was often inaccessible. Molotov, his foreign minister, was often inaccessible. And in fact, most of those in the American embassy who, who worked there for any length of time became profoundly anti-Soviet because of the conditions under which they had to work and because of the suspicion and the walls, the, the suspicion with which they were surrounded and the walls which they encountered. A few uh, journalists were allowed to come to Moscow and again, they found the same sort of frustration. They, they could not find people to ask questions. Nobody wanted to talk to them. If they did have an interview, it would be very much a sort of formal interview where, where someone would read from a bit of paper and simply make a statement. There was none of what Western journalists considered the proper way of, of asking questions. A number of American and, and British servicemen did come in in various capacities to the Soviet Union. Um, British sailors, for example, came in to Mamansk and Archangel. They were restricted to a very small area around the port. They were told they could go to one club which was set up by as it turned out, the KGB were hand-picked people. If they talked to local Soviet women who were actually quite keen to talk to them, um, those local Soviet women often got into trouble. A number of them formed relationships with British sailors um, or other British personnel working there, and they were often deported um, miles away from their, their hometowns. Um, fraternization was, was profoundly discouraged. And the same thing happened with the American air bases in Ukraine, which the Soviets very reluctantly um, allowed to be built. Um, the Americans have been pressing for them ever since, the, ever since they came into the war on the Soviet side, and the Soviets had been, had been resisting. But eventually, two or three air bases were built in what is today Ukraine. And again, um, the conditions were very restricted. Um, American personnel, if they went into the local towns, were watched the whole time. Any American, the Americans in their innocence, had sent Russian speakers to Russia, they thought this would make sense, children of immigrants or recent immigrants because they thought it would be easier to get on, which of course created profound suspicion. Who are these Russian speakers? They must be spies. And so they were constantly watched. Um, they found, you know, in spite of the willingness on the part of a number of, of Soviet military personnel to cooperate with them, they found that anything they wanted had to be requested. Often requests had to go back to Moscow where they simply disappeared for weeks on end. And so there was never the sort of relationship, for better or worse, that the British and the Americans had. That was a much fuller relationship which went right down from the leadership right down into, into quite often the lower, the, the lower ranks, into, the low, in, into society at large. That sort of relationship simply did not exist um, between the Soviet Union and the British and the Americans. Well, you probably all know the disagreements and I could list them all, but I'll just say something very briefly. Um, they disagreed both between the Americans and, and the British, um, but between the Soviets and the, the British and the Americans. This was never, an, never sort of just the British and Americans against the Soviets. Often it was a three-way disagreement. There was disagreements, of course, over strategy, disagreements between and within the British and the American forces over Europe versus the Pacific, disagreements over the Mediterranean strategy, going into North Africa and then going into Italy and possibly Greece, which the British favored. Um, disagreements, of course, over the opening of the Second Front, um, both between the Americans and the British. The Americans were pushing for a landing on the continent much earlier than the British felt that it was possible. They were pushing for it in 1942. 
without the landing craft, without the personnel, without the forces to do it. I mean, the, the American desire, I think, was premature. But the Soviets were pushing for it as well. And of course, the Soviets were fighting very, very hard until Stalingrad in, at the beginning of 1943. It was not at all clear that the Soviets were going to be able to prevail against the Germans. And so you got profound disagreements over the opening of the Second Front. And at Tehran, Stalin was openly uh, sarcastic and, and if, if not contemptuous of, of the British resistance to the idea of a Second Front. He kept on saying, it's just a little bit of water. I don't know what you're making such a fuss about. Um, it was. So it was, and Roosevelt, um, with Stalin's support, got the British to commit to, to a second front. There were disagreements and quarrels over resources and logistics. Again, between the United States and the British, the United States increasingly the great supplier, but also between the United States and the Soviet Union. Both the British and the Soviet Union felt that the United States was not doing as much as it could, that it could be sending more. Um, not very grateful necessarily for what the Americans did send. Um, I think it's been argued by Phillips, Pace, and O'Brien and others that without Lend-Lease, we know that the British couldn't have gone on, but without Lend-Lease, the Soviet Union might well not have been able to prevail as it did in the Second World War. Um, huge numbers of American cars, trucks, were poured into the Soviet Union, making it possible for the Soviet military to move in ways that they wouldn't have been able to before. And the aircraft the Americans provided, the technology the Americans provided, made a huge difference. Stalin mentioned this and accepted um, with some gratitude during the Second World War, but the prevailing line ever since has been that Lend-Lease made very little difference, that in fact we did it on our own and the Americans sent us some stuff that wasn't that good and we didn't really need it anyway. Um, and then, of course, you began to get disagreements over the peace. What is it going to look like? What sort of world are we going to have? And the disagreements were there at Tehran, um, highlighted at Yalta, and confirmed again at Potsdam. And there were disagreements over the fate of Germany, disagreements over the fate of Poland, disagreements over what Europe was going to look like after the war. Again, we don't know entirely what Stalin was thinking, but he seems to have thought that it would be possible for the Soviet influence to spread in Europe without the Soviet Union having to impose its type of government. He actually said on a number of occasions, we can have different kinds of socialism in different countries. We can let people choose their own way of, of getting to socialism. But given Stalin's control of the Soviet Union, it was unlikely that he would be able to tolerate that. In the end, he imposed very rigid and strict Soviet control from the top. And so, not surprisingly, after 1945, after the surrender of Germany and its allies, the alliance fell to pieces. It was already under terrific strain. It was already becoming clear by Yalta that they had very different views of what, was, what the world was going to be like. The Soviets seemed to have thought that they could continue to cooperate with the Americans and the British, that they would have this period of peaceful cooperation. They, they, they seemed to have been making plans for such a period of peaceful cooperation. But it was Soviet actions, in my view, that made that impossible. Opinion began to turn very swiftly in Britain and even more swiftly, I think, in the United States against the Soviet Union, um, recognizing the Soviet Union had made the end of the war possible, but dismayed at what the Soviet Union was doing in Europe as it imposed its empire. In March 1946, Churchill made his famous speech in Fulton, Missouri, when he talked about the Iron Curtain. And this was something, by this point, a number of people, not just Churchill, were feeling had happened. I don't think the alliance could have lasted into the post-1945 period. It was something that came together for war, but it lacked the substance that some of the broader and more lasting alliances, such as NATO, have had, that substance where you have shared attitudes, shared values, at least enough to make the alliance work. Well, we'll have to see what happens today with the Western Alliance and whether it's going to work as well, whether it's got sufficient depth and sufficient interrelationship for it to survive. It's under strain, and that strain is, I think, only going to grow. On that cheerful note, I'll leave you. But... <clears throat> Okay, folks, we can, we can settle in now and have a bit of a debate and a chat okay. um, about a rich, conceptually rich um, talk.
Um, okay, I think the play is, put your hands up please when you have questions. If you could state your name and your affiliation, that would be great. The team at the back have microphones and they will bring them around to, to make it nice and clear. We might start off with single questions and then add, maybe take two or three as we go if, if there are multiple questions. I at least have three questions. So okay. we could just sit here and have fun between us. Could we start at the very front? Oh, yeah, that'll do, yeah, just. Western Front Association, so wrong war, unfortunately. But uh, the question I have is, to what extent do you think the Nazi-Soviet pact impacted the views of the British and the Americans over Russia? And also what Russia was able to do with that pact in terms of moving into Poland and, uh, mm. and the Baltic states. Yeah. How far did that, do you think, impact the attitudes of the... Yeah. I think the Nazi-Soviet pact, which was, was created just before the Second World War broke out, in which they pledged neutrality um, in the case of, of, a war, of, of a war against either one of them, and which, of course, had the famous secret protocols in which they basically divided up the center of Europe, um, was seen by the British as, as confirmation of the untrustworthiness of the Soviets. I mean, they knew what they thought about Hitler already, but they felt that the Soviets were completely untrustworthy. Um, the Americans, I think, felt very much the same. What they expected, certainly the British did, um, and they had quite good intelligence, they expected that sooner or later, Hitler would probably make a move against the Soviet Union. And as the evidence began to come in from that, they tried, not always very successfully. Of course, they were collecting some through Ultra, so they couldn't, um, the, 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 the decoding at, at Bletchley, they couldn't reveal their sources. They tried to warn Stalin in a variety of ways that the, the Nazis were planning to attack. But Stalin was determined that it wouldn't be in the interest of the Nazis to attack. He, he thought, you know, no good capitalist power would attack when they can get everything they want anyway. Um, he was busily funneling whatever the Soviets, or whatever the Nazis wanted to Nazi Germany. And they, they got huge amounts of, of raw materials. Um, in return, he got considerable amount of, of technology and, and equipment. So I think the British thought and hoped, actually, that the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany would fall out. Um, when Hitler heard that Barbarossa had started, he said, I think, you know, he, he said, we may have been saved um, because if Germany takes on the, the Russian steamroller, um, then it is taking on probably too much. And, and Churchill, with his great understanding of history, remembered what had happened to Napoleon when he went to Russia in 1912. But I think, um, you know, I think from the British and American point of view, both were as reprehensible as the other. I think less was known about the Soviet Union, and so there were those on the left who thought it was a sort of paradise because of the tight control the Soviets had. Far more was known about Nazi Germany and the views. I mean, I've, I've looked at the Gallup polls, which are very useful for this period. Um, the American public becomes more and more antipathetic to Nazi Germany even though it doesn't want to fight it, but nevertheless, it becomes more and more hostile. Um, views of the Soviet Union are not so strong. Um, they're not, not nearly as strong, partly because less was known about it, I think. But once the Soviets um, become allies in the Second World War, there's, there's a very marked shift. And again, you get it in the United States. Stalin becomes Uncle Joe, and the Russian bear becomes a cuddly sort of teddy bear. And time has Stalin as its man of the year in 1942. Um, it, it, all, it goes too far. I mean, there's, there's an there's a, there's a almost foolish um, willingness to believe the best of the Soviet Union. And occasionally journalists and, and writers and others are taken on very carefully curated trips and shown various bits of the Soviet Union and write very favorable things. Again, you get that sudden reversal at the end of the Second World War when suddenly it turns out that Uncle Joe isn't so nice. And the cuddly bear is, is in fact, um, a ravening monster grabbing all sorts of Europe. And I mean, this, these, these are the cartoons. And so you get that sudden reversal again. But the Nazi-Soviet pact was, was seen as um, a pact between dictators. I think the British certainly had very good reason to think that it probably wouldn't last that long. I wonder if you can expand on the point about Gallup polls. Yeah. So is this a, is this a history of high politics and chiefs of staff? Yeah. Or does it extend to ordinary soldiers, ordinary citizens? Yeah. I think it has to extend to ordinary citizens, certainly in democracies. You know, what the ordinary Soviet citizens thought was not as important, although Stalin was, with reason, extremely worried about it after the German invasion. 
Um, you know, you, he suddenly did this concordat with the, with the Orthodox Church. Mm. You know, having torn down every church he could get his hands on and, and killed a great many priests, he suddenly decided the church was, represented the soul of Russia. Um, and he suddenly starts talking. You notice the language changes. Um, it's Mother Russia. It's not the Soviet Union so much. And he reintroduces Tsarist insignia into the armed forces. So, you know, I think he is worried. Mm. And it was one of the things he always worried about in the 30s, I think. He always worried because his view of the world was utterly paranoid, I think, and, and suspicious. He always worried that there were internal enemies within the Soviet Union who opposed socialism for whatever reason, who had links to eminent enemies outside. He always felt that Russia lived in a world of the Soviet Union, lived in a world with enemies everywhere. Um, and of course, if you came from a national minority inside Russia, if you were a German speaker or Polish speaker or Ukrainian, then you were really dangerous. Um, so I think from Stalin's point of view, um, he did care about the public only in as far as it could threaten the Soviet war effort and, and, and his own position. But I think he had enough power. and He may have faltered. There, there are stories that he lay drunk in a room um, after, after the German invasion, which I think are not true. Um, but he seems to have lost his nerve for a bit. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of times that Molotov and, and co, he was out at the Dacha not saying anything. And, and Molotov and, and Malenkov, I think, and a couple of others said, we better go and talk to him. And they came out to see him. And, and, and they were coming to ask him to take control of the sort of council of ministers. And Stalin was looking apparently very uneasy and said, what do you want with me? And I think he thought they'd come to bump him off, um, which is how Soviet politics tended to do changes of leadership. But sorry, this is a long-winded answer, but I think it was much more important in democracies where governments had to think about elections. And Roosevelt always took the pulse of American opinion very, very carefully indeed. He had digests of the press brought in every day. He read the Gallup polls, which started, I think, in 1936. Mm -hmm. And so he monitored them very closely indeed. And he was always very careful never to go too far out ahead of public opinion. It's, it drove a lot of people crazy because he would not take steps until he was sure the public was with him. I mean, sometimes he did, but he was always very careful. And he said once, he said, he, he, he made a couple of mistakes when, when he took on the Supreme Court in 1937 and got really lambasted for it. And he said to one of his advisors, it was a great mistake to go further than the American people want to do. And I didn't want to find myself out there again with no one behind me. So I think, you know, and, but in democracies, as the First World War had shown, it really matters, even in, in autocracies, it really matters. In a war of that scale, you have to have the public with you. Yeah. Sorry, long-winded you know, answer. Uh, the, the gentleman at the front. And then... Thank you. Mark Steele, uh, formerly of Boston University. Uh, I thought you might be able to tell us something about how the Dominion countries fit into the Grand Alliance. Well, the Canadians and Australians, if I'm speaking of the British Empire, were very concerned to make it clear they were coming in voluntarily. Um, you know, there had been this moment in this First World War where the British had declared war on, the, on behalf of the empire. And the Canadians had resented it, the Australians had resented it, um, the Indians had resented it. In the Second World War, they declared war separately. Um, Mackenzie King, the Canadian Prime Minister, actually waited for about, I think, a week before he declared war. He had every intention of declaring war on Germany, but he waited uh, when the, he waited after the British had done it. And so the, the Dominions came in very much on their own. India was in a slightly different situation because it was partly independent, but not yet as independent as Canada or Australia or South Africa or New Zealand. And so it's still, had a um, considerable amount of, of British influence. But two million Indians volunteered to fight in the Second World War, so, so clearly there was some sort of support in India for it. Um, but certainly in the case of Canada, um, which is the case I know best, the Canadians simply assumed they would be coming in, um, but they wanted to make it quite clear they were coming in as themselves. And the Canadian contribution, like the Australian and Indian contribution to the, the British war effort was enormous. Um, I found it intensely irritating um, in the run-up to the um, referendum campaign on whether to leave Europe. There was a lot of talk about how in 1940 we in Britain fought alone and we can fight alone again and we've always fought alone. And I thought, as a Canadian, this is uh, wrong. You know, I mean, there were, and, and how many Australian divisions were in, were in the Middle East and, and in Britain? A quarter of all the pilots flying for the RAF Bomber Command were Canadian. Um, you know, the huge financial amount, the Canadian Navy was taking over part of the, the, the convoying on, on the North Atlantic Passage. So the British did have 
on the whole, the willing cooperation of their empire. Not all parts of the empire, then some parts of the empire had no choice. But certainly the, the ones that were more advanced in self-government came in willingly. Can we go down the middle there, please? There's two, can we take two questions together? Ems you want? Yeah, yeah let's, let's go for the Halik, Halik, who has just won the uh, Wolfson Prize. Congratulations. Who's that? Um, good evening. Uh, Chris Close Donkin, enough. interested amateur and nothing more. Um, given the, the, the cracks that were clearly showing in the, in the alliance even by early 1945, what, what, in your view, was really going on in Churchill's mind around uh, Operation Unthinkable? Around the British. Sorry? What was the last word, the British? Operation Unthinkable. Operation? Unthinkable, the, the British plan for uh, attack on the Soviet Union. Oh, Paul, the, so can, I, can we take two questions? Okay. So will you, Paul, will you hand it to the lady in blue as well? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry, Halleck Kohinski, independent scholar. Um, I was interested in what you said about trust, because I, what I have been always interested in is how they undermined each other. Um, to give examples, at Tehran, Roosevelt going off for private chats with Stalin and sort of saying, well, I agree with you totally, but I can't say anything publicly because of the presidential election. And similarly, Churchill's signing of the naughty document. Yeah. The percentages agreement in October 1944. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Sure. Well, both of them, both involving Churchill. Um, yeah, Churchill's plan was, I think, a plan of desperation, and his military thought it was crazy. Um, the idea was that if the United States pulled out of Europe after 45, after the war was over, which it said it was going to do, you know, the Americans had no intention. I mean, they've still got troops here. They had no intention of that ever happening. You know, they were going to go back to the United States. They were going to demobilize. They were going to go back onto a peacetime footing. And so Churchill ordered his military to prepare this plan, which I think they mostly thought was completely crazy. I mean, the British didn't have the resources. They didn't have the manpower. Um, the British public would not have gone for it. And the Soviets, I mean, this is what I always say when people say Yalta was a complete betrayal of the center of Europe. The Soviets were there. You know, they were there in force. They had millions of troops there. And there was no way that the British could have taken them on. No, I think it was just Churchill you know, stabbing at the door. Churchill loved grand schemes, uh, most of which you know, his, his military thought were completely impossible. Um, you know, Alan Brook, who was his chief military advisor, said, I sometimes think we won't win the war with, with him. I don't know how we'll win it without him. You know, that was the dilemma the military found. Um, on the issue of trust, yes, no, trust is, is never complete. Um, but what Roosevelt was trying to do at Tehran, and I think wrongly myself, he was trying to show Stalin that he trusted Stalin and that he, Roosevelt, could be trusted. And so when the Soviets came up with, I think, this highly dubious theory that elements of, of you know, a crack German assassination team had landed in Tehran or smuggled themselves into Tehran and were going to kill Roosevelt and said to Roosevelt, you'd be much safer staying in the Soviet embassy, Roosevelt accepted the invitation in order to show that he completely trusted Stalin. Of course, Roosevelt's room was bugged, um, according to Beria's son's memoirs, and the Russians would sit there listening to Roosevelt and people talking, saying, don't they know we're listening to them? You know, they couldn't, under, couldn't believe that they would talk so freely, also that people would disagree with Roosevelt, because you didn't do that with Stalin in quite the same way. Um, but I think what, Stalin, what Roosevelt was trying to do there was to show Stalin that he could be trusted and he was trying to detach himself from, from Churchill as the imperialist. Um, you know, Churchill, the Americans thought that the British were probably more imperialist and more determined to hang on to the empire than they actually were. Um, they mistook, in my view, Churchill for being typical of all, as being typical of all, all British politicians. In fact, we know the Labour Party um, were quite prepared to see the empire being wound up um, over, over the next years after the war ended. So I think what was happening then, and was certainly, it was very hurtful to Churchill. I think, in a way, Roosevelt behaved badly. But he said in a letter to a distant cousin, um, Daisy Stukeley, who he wrote a lot to, and he said, you know, I'm just going to pull old Winston's leg, and I'm going to sort of show Joe that, you know, Uncle Joe, that he, he can trust me, that I'm really a good guy. Um, it was unkind to Churchill. And there were a couple of occasions when Churchill got extremely upset and sort of marched out. But he did then, Roosevelt did then sort of make it up to Churchill, said, I was ribbing you a bit. He said, but you know, I had to show Joe that you know, um, we, we, I have differences of opinion with you. And, and I think Churchill understood it. Um, not that he had much choice. He had, to, he had to rely on Roosevelt. 
But you're right. I mean, it was, I think, <clears throat> sorry, a very unfortunate episode, and I think Churchill was badly treated. And I'm not sure it made Stalin trust Roosevelt any more. I mean, both Churchill and, and Roosevelt had, I think, uh, highly unrealistic ideas of what Stalin was really like. Um, you know, Roosevelt said at one point, you know, you look into his eyes and you can see he went to a seminary. Um, it's like George Bush looking into Putin's eyes and seeing his soul. Um, you know, not very convincing. Um, they also developed this theory, certainly Churchill did, and Roosevelt went on with it. Whenever they got a rude letter from Stalin, they said, oh, that's his ministers, that's his hardline ministers, that's the bad Stalin. And then they'd get a sort of friendly thing or a happy birthday from Stalin, and they'd say, that's, that's, that's Stalin. You know, so, so they explained away some of the um, crudities and, and insults that came from Stalin. And as Stalin grew more confident, he became often more brusque. And they explained it away by saying, oh, that's just, he's being pushed by his, his hardline ministers. Uh, he's not really like that. Shall we take two from online? And then Paula, we might take two questions at the front here. Yeah. All right, um, we've got one question um, from our online audience. This is from Sorry, Mark Bowen, who writes, it's axiomatic that there are no friendly intelligence services, though the Five Eyes may be an exception. Can you talk a bit about the relationship between the Grand Alliance and intelligence sharing? Okay. That's all for us for now. Okay, go. Do you want me to? Yeah, I'd say answer that. And then we'll okay. Um, I think I know who asked that question, who knows much more about, if it's Mark Bowen, he knows a lot more about intelligence than I do. Um, there was intelligence sharing. Churchill shared a lot of the ultra-intelligence with Stalin um, before Barbarossa took place. Uh, you know, reports, and also reports that had been picked up by British diplomats in, in capitals around the center of Europe, where they would have German military attaches saying, we're going into Russia next month. Um, you know, and the fact that, I mean, it, it was fairly obvious. I mean, the Germans had moved huge numbers of troops close to the Russian border. Um, when, when Stalin raised it with the Germans, they said, oh, we're just giving them a rest from France and they just you know, need a bit of fresh air and you know, completely unconvincing. Uh, Hitler said this completely unconvincing. The trouble with intelligence sharing, um, particularly if you're sharing it with the Soviet Union, is they're only gonna believe what they want to believe and they're probably not gonna trust you anyway because they're going to think you have an ulterior motive for doing it. And so although Stalin got a lot of warning about Barbarossa, about the German invasion of the Soviet Union, he tended not to believe it. He thought the British were trying to embroil him in a war with, with Hitler, which of course is what the British wanted. But in fact, they were passing on legitimate intelligence, but he was not prepared to believe it. And when you have someone as suspicious as, as Stalin, um, he tends to mistrust everything that comes across his desk. And so he simply, when he got reports, and he had highly placed spies in, in Berlin. When he got reports from Berlin, he tended to think it was misinformation again. He said, it, you know, that it, it, it may be the British trying to get us into a war with, trying to get us into, into a war with, with, um, with Germany, and we, we simply will not fall for it. And then you got, just before Barbarossa, that very strange episode of Rudolf Hess landing, um, trying to find the Duke of, of Hamilton, who he felt was a sympathizer, landing in a field, much to the bewilderment of the Scottish farmers who found him there. And um, Stalin was, was, I think, fairly persuaded that this was a plot of the British and that Hess was bringing some sort of peace offer to the British um, and the British were going to then try and encourage the, Soviet, the Germans to attack the Soviet Union. So there was intelligence sharing um, with Stalin, but he tended not to believe it. The British and the Americans did share a lot of intelligence and they, they had developed, in fact, a very close relationship and shared intelligence even before the Americans came into the war. Um, they had begun to do that. And so I think they trusted each other and that relationship was one that survived and I think survives up to the present day in spite of blips in the relationship as, as the Five Eyes in general has survived. Okay, Paula, so let, let's take, um, so I can see kind of three pockets of questions. There's still a question down here. So can we come up front and you wanna take it back there? Okay, we'll take a pocket of questions there. Can you do three, two or three questions, please? Sorry, folks, then we'll go you. And then we'll come over here. We have, Do you um, need your um, pencil? You can keep it. Yeah. Hello, hi. Uh, thank you for the amazing talk. That was excellent. I'm a recent postgraduate from Bristol. And I was amazed by your anecdotes you gave about the personal relationship between Churchill and Stalin and stuff. And I was wondering, what do you think, if, if they were different people, if they weren't Churchill, it wasn't Stalin, do you think the Alliance would have been affected by that? Uh, and in what way? Okay, thank you. Let me add another question. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm from uh, Kingston, Ontario, so oh, hi from hi. home. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I was actually just wondering, 
you know, we talk about the big three a lot, um, but what's something that like a country like Canada um, contributed to the Alliance that's like an unsung story that isn't really talked about, but you would know a lot about? Sorry, I missed the end of that. Um, that was like something that the Canadians contributed to the big three or the Alliance or the, the war. The Canadian part of it, okay. Yeah, that yeah. isn't really talked about because we focus a lot on obviously the big three. Sure. Should we go with that? Maybe you could add in China as well, I don't know. What, China in the Second World War? Yeah, just to make it easy for you. Okay. Um, well, the personalities, I think, are interesting. I mean, there's always this debate among historians, especially, well, not, not just those of us who do political history or history of international relations, how much of the personalities matter. And, you know, the, you don't want to say they matter entirely. On the other hand, I don't think you can discount them sometimes. And I think we look at the world today, would we have the war in Ukraine without Putin? Would we have China following a particular policy that it's following, say, towards Taiwan without Xi Jinping? Um, if President Trump gets reelected, will that make a difference to American policy? I think so. So you know, who is in positions of power occupying powerful offices with the capacity to use those offices and to make decisions does matter. I think in the case of the, of the Second World War, the big three personalities are very important, um, partly because they had very large and, and powerful countries, and in the case of the British and Empire, but also because you can see reflected in their personalities some of the decisions that are made. Yes, they had advisors. In the case of Stalin, he, he tended to dominate all decisions. You know, the people around him were, were essentially broken men. They did what they were told. I mean, you know, you're Molotov, you're his foreign minister, he's got your wife off in the gulag. Um, you know, are you gonna disagree with him really? Well, Molotov did more than the others, but you have to be very, very careful how you do it. And so Stalin, and Stalin took an intense interest. I mean, he, one of the things he did do was work extremely hard and, and huge amounts of material went across his desk and he made notes on it. I mean, this has, this has been explored in the archives. So I think the personalities matter. And I think Churchill laid himself out. He was both important as a British war leader, and particularly, I think, in 1940. I think later on, I think he, he often advocated some very um, bad policies or, or listened to perhaps to the wrong advisors. But I think he laid himself out to charm Roosevelt, and I think he largely succeeded. Um, Roosevelt was a very tricky and difficult customer, but I think as much as he liked anyone, he did like Churchill, although he never again completely trusted him. And Roosevelt, I think, was, was enormously important. Roosevelt, in his own way, and whether you think this was good or bad, I mean, he's still a divisive figure in the US, but Roosevelt managed to get the United States into the war, or managed to get it ready for war before Pearl Harbor. I and mean, I think this was very important. He moved the Americans towards thinking that war was coming, and he made Lendley's possible. And before Lend, where, where the huge amounts of American equipment were basically given to the Soviets, given to the British first, and then when the Soviet Union was attacked, given to the Soviets, on the understanding they'd eventually return them, um, which everybody knew wasn't probably going to happen. You know, a used truck that's been, you know, battering around on the Eastern Front isn't going to be much use um, five years later. But it was very, very important indeed. And, and whether another politician could have done it and finessed it in the way Roosevelt did, I don't know. So I think the personalities were important. Of course, so was a lot else. So were the productive capacities. The fact that the United States could outproduce the Japanese, outproduce the Soviets, outproduce the Nazis, outproduce, you know, the, the, the capacity of the United States was extraordinary. Um, you know, by the end of the war, they had 150 aircraft carriers. Um, the Japanese, I think, had at most 15. You know, the, the Americans were just producing and producing. Their, their capacity was huge. Um, on Canada, um, the Canadians were very much um, junior members of the alliance. Um, a couple of important meetings were held in Quebec, and Mackenzie King, the Canadian prime minister, who knew both Churchill and Roosevelt, knew Roosevelt quite well. Um, they'd met first at Harvard um, before the First World War, and Mackenzie King was one of the few people Roosevelt invited to come and stay at the White House. Um, so the two of them, and they would sit around in the evening and talk about the world. I mean, I think there was a sort of friendship there. But they, but Canada was at the meetings, but not in the big meetings. So in Quebec, um, Mackenzie King actually says in his diary, and the diary is, is worth reading, you may have read it, um, says in his diary, I, I did feel a bit like a sort of superior sort of butler. You know, I made sure everything was okay, but I wasn't invited in to the end of meeting. But the Canadians were consulted. 
And they were a major player. I mean, they helped to finance the British war effort. And by the end of the war, it's hard to believe, but I think we had the fourth biggest army in the world, or armed forces in the world, um, partly because some of the others, of course, had been destroyed. As far as China goes, it was a real difference of opinion. I think when, in the case of, of Stalin, um, he, was, he, was, he, he was watching what happened in China. Um, he did not want to get involved in a war with Japan. I mean, he'd signed a non-aggression pact with Japan in 1940 after some fighting on the common frontier. And he you know, was very reluctant to fight on two fronts and, and only came in into war against Japan in, in the last few weeks, which, which he eventually promised to do when it looked like he was safe on his western front or on his eastern front. Um, in the case of the United States, Roosevelt had this plan, and I'm not sure quite what it was based on, that China would become one of the four policemen of the world, that after the war was over, there'd be the Soviet Union, the British Empire, the United States, and China, and together they would form a sort of group who would help to make the world um, a safer place, help to provide stability. Um, he pushed China to become a member, permanent member of the UN Security Council. He pushed China um, to be brought into a number of international conferences. And I think he saw China as a force for stability in the Far East once Japan had been, had been defeated. In the end, that, that wasn't what happened. But Roosevelt seems to have had this, this hope that China would become something more important than it was. Uh, this was Chiang Kai-shek's China, not communist China. Um, in the case of Britain, um, the British, I think, were less persuaded of the potential of China. I mean, they were perfectly happy to trade with China, to look after their investments in China, but they had few illusions about the nature of the Guomindang government. And so I don't think they particularly um, saw China as being important, but they went along with what Roosevelt wanted because the Americans were doing the bulk of the fighting in the Far East, and it was their war, essentially. Okay, let's take Eddie and then. Yeah, Eddie O'Sullivan, specialist in the Italian campaign. Um, thank you very much for dealing with China because 80 years ago in November was the Sexton Conference involving Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Chiang Kai-shek. Yeah. And they had a plan. Yeah. So that's the big four. There was a big four. Yeah. Then actually, shouldn't you be talking about the big five? Yeah. Because in 1943, there was a summit in Casablanca involving Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and the French. Yeah. Metropolitan France was, was occupied, but it was an allied nation. And this month in Italy, the French army was being reconstituted under General Joanne. So could you share with us, you dealt with how Stalin viewed and Churchill viewed China. I'm interested in what Churchill thought of China. And how they, the three, the big three, viewed the other one, which is France, which is an ally and is going to play a very important role in well, the liberation of Europe. Yeah. And can, we, um, can we ask the, the young yeah. lady here at the front as well? Okay. We'll take two questions. Is that okay? Because I think there's a lot of people with questions, and, and I'll try and I'll try and I'll, I'll try and be very short. Yeah, Sorry, I think, I I think to... yeah. yeah. Firstly, thanks. I just wanted to say thank you for such a fascinating lecture. Um, my name is Devin. I'm a recent graduate of the War Studies Department. Yeah. In your most recent book, you talk about the role of human nature and sort of the whys and hows of why humans go to war. Yeah. And so I was wondering, building off of that and the tendency that humans have to form groups and tribes, are there any sort of relationship or behavioral patterns that we can apply to? Alliances at the national level. Apply to? Alliances at the national level. Ah, yes, that's interesting. Well, I'll deal with that first because, as you know, there is a great debate among the evolutionary biologists and others and um, historians such as me about what actually determines human behavior. And are we condemned by our biological inheritance to fight? Do we have certain behavior patterns? And there's been some very interesting research done on this, and, and clearly we have certain traits as a species that, you know, the, the fear or fight, flight or, or, or fear, flight or, or fight, you know, is something which seems to be ingrained in us and seems to be ingrained in our closest cousins, the chimpanzees, um, who are very close cousins indeed. Do we, do we fully know what we're doing and what motivates us. And I'm, I'm sure we don't. I mean, I'm sure, you know, we like certain people and we don't like other people instinctively, not because of anything they say or do, but we, we, we get a sense. I mean, I do think we, we have that. But I think that that's mediated through culture, in my view, and that we are products of our cultures. And people behave in certain ways because of the culture in which they grow up. 
And so you look at the ways in which cultures have changed. In Germany, for example, where you got what could be called a militaristic culture, certainly in certain parts of society, up to and including the Second World War, that's gone. Um, or Sweden, you know, in the 17th century, if you were in any part of Europe during the Thirty Years' War and you heard the Swedes were coming, you cleared out. I mean, they were not coming to give you Ikea and, and you know, berries from the forest. They were coming to rape, loot, and pillage. I mean, they were dreadful. They were, they were absolutely ruthless. And so I do think it's a debate that will go on. Um, and I think the more we learn about um, human impulses and human biology, I think the more interesting it gets. I was just reading something earlier today about, that Freud wrote about how much we are creatures, our impulses, and how he felt that we were divided between what he called um, Thanatos, or, or no, it was between Eros and Thanatos. Eros was, was not sexualized love, but Eros was um, love of life, um, and, what, and, and Thanatos was the love of death. And so it's, it's love versus death. And he felt that these impulses were always at a war within us. But I think culture plays a huge part, whatever the truth of that, culture plays a huge part in mediating the ways in which we behave, the things we think value. And none of us, I think, or very few of us are natural soldiers, natural killers. Um, that's why there's so much training in the military. You have to take people and turn them into someone who will risk his or her life and be prepared to take another's life. You know, the, that's why you know, the training has, has a purpose and it's not just learning to march nicely. It's learning to do things which may go against your, your deepest instincts. So a debate that goes on, and I don't know the answer, so maybe you'll find out more about it in the course of your work, I hope. Um, as far as um, France goes, yeah, I mean, look, all as the Americans wanted to make China into a policeman, and China was not equipped to do it. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the sufferings of China, I mean, China had been fighting since 1931. Chiang Kai-shek had lost a good deal with his army. He was also facing a very strong communist force in, in the northeast of China. It was highly unlikely. The British had no illusions about Chiang Kai-shek's regime. It was also deeply corrupt. The Americans, I think, knew some of that, but I think they still thought that if they promoted Chiang Kai-shek and they promoted China, they would be able to manage, which is perhaps why the corresponding American shock when China fell to the communists. Um, you know, the, the more they had bulked up China, the more horrified they were when it didn't work. And then there was all that ridiculous stuff in the 50s of we lost China or who lost China, which, which had never been theirs in the first place. As far as France goes, it, it was similar, it, it, but a bit different. But the British definitely wanted France as a European power again. Um, they felt that the continent of Europe, they, they worried about, as did many people, the revival of German power. And there was talk initially of you know, dividing Germany up into its component parts or turning it into some sort of little agricultural paradise, the Morgenthau plan, where all Germans would be sheep farmers and, and have no industry. I mean, it was completely unrealistic. Um, there was always a fear of the revival of German power, as had happened after the First World War. And I think with France, the British very much wanted France as a bulwark against that. Um, France still had an empire. It was still a world power. And the Americans... I think, had an unreasoning dislike. Well, it was easy to dislike de Gaulle. Um, and the Americans, and the British certainly did at times, but the British saw his appeal to the French and believed he was the only Frenchman who could actually bring the country together. Uh, they had no faith in, in you know, some of his, his opponents, uh, like Giraudoux, or they simply didn't think that he had the capacity. Um, the Americans absolutely couldn't stand de Gaulle and resisted as long as possible, recognizing him as the leader of France. Um, uh, but they, they found themselves unable to stop him, um, as many did. You know, de Gaulle was sort of unstoppable. So I think, but it, it, it was an analogous situation. But in the case of France, France did manage to get a workable government, which Chiang Kai-shek was, was increasingly less able to do. Okay, we have four minutes. So can I take... Paula, can we go around this side? Because these very patient um, folks... Oh. Thanks, Eleanor. Yes, we'll take that one. And then, is there a gentleman with a stripey jumper? We take those two. That's it, folks. And then you can answer it as you please. Okay. Thank Hi. you. Hi. Um, Alexander Chilovsky from the National Archives. Um, you sort of mentioned a little bit what, uh, Hitler th um, what, what Stalin thought about Hitler and the capitalist powers. Um, what did sort of Roosevelt and Churchill think of Stalin? Did they think him as sort of a a, a realist Russian nationalist who could be contained or someone yeah. bent on world revolution. Yeah. Stripey jumper. Thanks, Eleanor. 
Thank you. Uh, Emil Wilson, uh, King's College alumni at War Studies as well. Uh, thank you for your lecture. And so final question, I guess, is in your opinion, despite of how the Grand Alliance faded out towards the end of the war or in 1945, do you think there's enough recognition amongst the, the Western allies of the horrid experiences that the Soviets experienced yeah. uh, when, uh, in, their, in the war against uh, the Nazi, Nazi Germans? Yeah. Um, <coughs> well, on Stalin, um, I don't think most people outside the Soviet Union understood the full extent of what the Soviet Union was like because there were so few sources that they could find out from. Um, you know, there was so little capacity um, on the part of Western powers or journalists to find out. And, and so the, the, the diplomats, as I've said, were so limited in what they could do. Um, there was, I think, concern, um, and in some cases shock in the West about the show trials. Um, there were reports of, of collectivization and, and the horrors that were caused um, by the forced collectivization of, of the Kulaks. But I think the full extent of what was happening was not properly understood. And you got what Lenin would have called useful idiots who went to the Soviet Union, wrote glowing, was shown, um, you know, shown sites. I mean, there was a famous case where I think um, a party of American women, possibly including Eleanor Roosevelt, were taken to an orphanage which was filled with fat, happy little children playing games. The real orphans had been sent away for the day, and these were the children of the KGB um, who got better food than anyone else. You know, there was, there was a lot of stage stuff like that. Um, and then there was the notorious, whose name I'm now forgetting, um, correspondent of the New York Times. Um, what was it? Yes, Walter Durante, who, who, there used to be a plaque on the wall of the New York Times for his honest reporting. They've since taken it down or they've amended it, um, who said everything is great and, and, you know, what are people complaining about? Or the Webbs, or Bernard Shaw, who went to Russia and, you know, so said it's all wonderful and people look very happy and I don't know what everyone's complaining about. So there was a lot of illusion about the Soviet Union and I think a full understanding of what Stalin's regime was like was, was very difficult to get, even for the Russians themselves or the Soviet peoples themselves. And so I think, you know, I think Stalin was seen by, by both Churchill and Roosevelt as someone who was very tough, who'd come up through a revolutionary world, who'd fought his way up. Um, I don't think they ever quite realized um, just how um, many crimes he'd committed or been responsible for. And as far as Stalin as, as a war leader, I mean, yes, the Soviets made terrible sacrifices and the war on the Eastern Front was fought, as Timothy Snyder and others have pointed out, with absolute brutality and, and any lack of restraint. I mean, it, it was a war of extermination. The Germans, Nazis treated the, the Soviet prisoners of war appallingly. They, they, they shot huge numbers of the population, um, including, of course, the Jews, but not just the Jews, they, they, they killed um, ethnic minorities everywhere. I mean, they, 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 were, they treated the territories they conquered as, as theirs to do whatever they wanted and what they wanted to do was, was, was fearful and frightful. Um, and so there was, I think, a, the, the war on the Eastern Front was appalling. My own view is it was made much worse by Stalin. Um, he eventually backed off, but in the initial stages of the war, he interfered with his generals and he told them not to retreat. So for example, um, something like 100,000, I think, um, Soviet soldiers were, were surrounded at Kiev because he would not let them retreat, um, rather like some of the orders that Hitler used to give. Um, you know, if you look at the initial Soviet losses in the first six weeks of Barbarossa, the first two months of Barbarossa, they're absolutely hideous. And a lot of that is because Stalin would not allow his military to retreat. He eventually learned to back off and he learned to let people like Zhukov do what they did. But he fought as, as the... I don't want to say the Russians always do, but he certainly fought as Putin seems to fight with very little regard for how many lives he was losing. Um, he simply doesn't seem to have cared about how many were killed. Um, it was irrelevant to him. After all, he'd already killed a great many of his own people in the 1930s. Um, you know, he was not someone who shrank um, from casualties or death. Happy? Yeah, well, no, not to end on that note. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I apologize, but... Um, Perhaps we all need a drink. Yeah. Well, listen, a day like this takes a lot of organization. May I thank my fellow directors of the Sir Michael Howard Center, Mark Kondos, who's standing at the back, yeah, uh, Christina Golter, yeah. who's sitting here at the front, um, Bill Philpott, and I'm Jonathan Fennell. Um, I'd also like to thank Megan Hamilton, who's our uh, postgraduate lead at the center, and the, the comms team, Megan at the front here, and the comms team who've done a lot of the heavy lifting that's now Mark is 
Yeah. Yeah. And finally, may I thank Professor Margaret McMillan for giving us a marvelous oh. annual lecture. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks.